She made history when President Ronald Reagan appointed her to be the first woman to serve on the U.S. Supreme Court. She shaped history during almost a quarter century on the bench. Her life inspired others to blaze their own trails in law and in other fields. Sandra Day O'Connor was an independent thinker shaped by the Arizona desert she loved. The Arizona Ranch Girl will be remembered as one of the most influential women in American history. Sandra Day was born March 26, 1930 in El Paso, Texas. She divided her childhood between Texas and the family's Lazy Bee cattle ranch near Duncan, Arizona, not far from the Arizona-New Mexico line. By eight years old, she was mending fences, riding with cowboys, driving a truck, and firing her own 22 caliber rifle. At 17, she left home to attend college at Stanford University. She earned a degree in economics in three years and then finished third in her class in law school. She married fellow Stanford law student John J. O'Connor III in 1952. Getting a job as a lawyer was tough in the early 1950s when many law firms refused to hire women. She offered to work for free for the San Mateo County attorney until he had money in his budget to pay her. After moving back to her home state with her husband, O'Connor practiced law in Phoenix. She stayed home with their three sons when they were young, and she began to get involved in Republican politics. She served as Assistant State Attorney General, as the Arizona Senate Majority Leader, and then she was elected as a Maricopa County Superior Court Judge in 1974. Five years later, in 1979, then-Governor Bruce Babbitt, a Democrat, appointed her to the state's Court of Appeals. Arizona's second highest court. Two years later, President Ronald Reagan tapped her for the U.S. Supreme Court. She had never heard a federal case before she was sworn in. O'Connor was a surprise pick for the high court, but she had well-placed allies. She met Chief Justice Warren Burger through former Phoenix Mayor John Driggs, a mutual friend. At Stanford, she had dated eventual Supreme Court Chief Justice William Rehnquist another Arizonan who supported her nomination. And the U.S. Senators from Arizona at that time, Republican Barry Goldwater and Democrat Dennis DeConcini, recommended her for the job. Nationally, Republicans worried she wasn't conservative enough, especially on abortion. But the Senate confirmed her 99-0, and she was sworn in by Chief Justice Berger in September 1981. She felt a special responsibility as the first female justice, she told National Public Radio in 2013. She said, quote, it became very important that I perform in a way that wouldn't provide some reason or cause not to have more women in the future. That was very important to me. The facts of the case guided her decisions, not a political stance. She did not consistently vote with one block or another. She was independent. Simply, she respected people's rights as Americans and let that be her guide. Her decisions often were based on judicial standards of equality under the law, states' rights, and individual rights to privacy, not on advocacy or idealism. As the court became more conservative during her tenure, legal scholars say O'Connor's role shifted from that of cautious conservative to a crucial centrist. She set tone and direction on such issues as abortion, capital punishment, affirmative action, free speech, and separation of church and state. In a 1992 ruling upholding legal abortion rights, O'Connor declared that Roe v. Wade is a rule of law and a component of liberty we cannot renounce. O'Connor consistently voted to let stand the central concept of the ruling but she also upheld the various states' rights to impose reasonable restrictions on access to abortion. In 2003, she was the deciding vote in a case upholding affirmative action at the University of Michigan Law School. She also voted with the majority to strike down a Texas law that essentially criminalized same-sex sexual activity. In perhaps the most consequential case of her career, O'Connor helped form the 5-4 majority to end the Florida presidential election recount of 2000, which effectively handed the presidency to George W. Bush. O'Connor's love of the U.S. judicial system extended beyond her work on the high court. 
She assisted governments in many former Soviet bloc countries in setting up legal systems from scratch. She retired from the court in January 2006 to care for her husband. He had Alzheimer's disease. But she remained active in a variety of causes. She launched Our Courts in 2009, which is a website she created to offer interactive civics lessons to students and teachers. She founded the organization now known as the Sandra Day O'Connor Institute. Its programs are dedicated to promoting civil discourse, civic engagement, and civics education. She's been asked many times about the legacy she would like to leave, which she referred to as, quote, the tombstone question. She said, quote, I hope it says, here lies a good judge.